Welcome to the Get Going Podcast. I am Ken Johnson, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming to you today from Jacksonville, Illinois, with a garden bite. And on this week's garden bite, we're going to talk a little bit about wasps. Good bugs that get a bad name. So typically when we mention wasps to somebody, uh, usually we're going to get a negative reaction. We often see wasps as scary, angry, aggressive insects. Uh, They're dangerous and are likely to sting uh, when provoked. While some wasps can be aggressive at times, uh, and and a lot of them will pack a powerful, painful sting, um, they're actually good insects to have around. In a lot of cases, they are the unsung heroes uh, in a lot of our landscapes. So why do wasps um, get a bad name? Like many other things, um, one or a handful of individuals kind of ruins everything for everyone else. Uh, and, and wasps are going to be no exceptions to this. So they're around, one, there are over 100,000 described species of wasps worldwide. Of those, about 33,000 are considered stinging or the aculate wasps. Uh, and about 1,000 of those are going to be social. So things like yellow jackets, bald-faced, horn, bald-faced hornets, paper wasps, so on. Uh, and these are the wasps. These social wasps are, t- are typically the ones that are going to give the the entire group uh, a bad name. Um, the the ones we most commonly interact with and are most frequently stung by. So while they're out foraging, social wasps aren't particularly uh, aggressive, uh, but that all kind of changes when when nests are involved. So social wasps, and particularly yellow jackets, are kind of notorious for aggressively defending their nests, uh, which again can result in painful stings uh, for those of us that may get too close or Uh, accidentally disturb those nests if we don't know they're there. Uh, But not just wasps will do this. Uh, When we think about social bees like honeybees, uh, bumblebees, uh, things like ants, they will also defend their nests from perceived threats. So why do wasps get a worse name than these other uh, stinging insects? Uh, Is it because their stings are, on average, more painful? Uh, The stings of wasps are more painful on average than than those of bees or ants? Uh, Or is it because we don't recognize or maybe we're unaware of the benefits that wasps provide, like we do, uh, for example, for bees. Bees are widely accepted as as very important pollinators, and, and we need them. But wasps also provide many different benefits to us as humans. Uh, so some of those different benefits, pollinators. So while bees get most of the attention when it comes to pollinating insects, uh, wasps will also act as pollinators. While the, the larvae of most wasps are going to be carnivores, Gull wasps would be an exception to this. The adults are going to feed on uh, sugars, which is why we commonly see them um, around sugary drinks, especially in the fall. Um, But for the most part, they're often getting this in the form of of nectar. So while feeding on nectar, wasps may also pollinate flowers. And in some cases, they can be as efficient as pollinating as bees or can even take the place of bees. So there's some research done uh, in Wisconsin, and I will include a link to the, the paper in the show notes here where they looked at world milkweed uh, and they excluded bumblebees from an area with uh, world milkweed. And they found that uh, paper wasps were able to come in and and replace uh, bumblebees and and were just as effective at pollinating uh, that world milkweed as bumblebees were. So they can be important pollinators for our plants. Next, they can be uh, important predators. So wasps are gonna be vital for controlling insect populations in our landscapes. Again, our social wasps will capture a a wide variety of insects. They're kind of generalist predators, so they can catch it. They're going to do that. So there's going to be things like flies, caterpillars, beetles. They'll they'll catch them. They'll chew them up. They'll kind of masticate them. And then they will feed them to their larvae. Solitary wasps, on the other hand, tend to be a little more focused on what they're feeding their young. Uh, They often attack one one type or one group of insects. So example, uh, great golden digger wasps, great black wasps. Uh, will paralyze katydids, grasshoppers, crickets, those related insects. They will bring them back to their burrows uh, as food for their for their larvae. Other things like the blue-winged wasps will dig into the ground, and they will paralyze and lay eggs on grubs of scarab beetles, so like June beetles, Japanese beetles, uh, and they can be important for helping to control the populations uh, of those insects. Parasitoid wasps are also incredibly important uh, when it comes to controlling insect populations, so these are not sting- what we would consider stinging wasps. Uh, most parasitoid wasps are going to be uh, very small. Most of us would probably confuse them for a gnat. Uh, and, and a lot of times they may only attack one type of insect, uh, like caterpillars. Or in some cases, they may be specific to the species. They only attack one species of insects. Uh, but they're, again, they're going to attack all kinds of different insects. Pretty much any insect is going to have some parasitoid wasp 
uh, that's going to attack it. Uh, but for, for us as, as gardeners, uh, for example, uh, aphids, white flies, mealybugs, caterpillars, insect eggs, uh, they, those are all readily parasitized by various types uh, of wasps. Now, so what they'll do, uh, they will lay an egg in or on an insect, uh, and then that egg will hatch. The larvae will consume their host. In the case of aphids, those eggs are laid on the inside of the aphid. The larvae eats the inside of the aphid. It will pupate, and the adult wasps will emerge uh, from that aphid. They'll go out and lay eggs uh, in new hosts. So a lot of times for some of our smaller insect pests, uh, like aphids, if we just leave those alone uh, long enough, our, our parasoid wasps and other beneficial insects will eventually find those and clean up those populations for us without us really having to do much to them. Wasps also act as food uh, for other organisms. So not only are they eating stuff, stuff is going to be eating them. So a lot of different birds, crows, orioles, bluebirds, sparrows, chickadees uh, may eat wasps as part of their diets. Uh, there are some other birds like the summer tanager, uh, which specialize on bees and wasps. That makes up the majority uh, of their diet. Uh, even some mammals, bears, which may or may not be all that important for Illinois, uh, but skunks, sometimes raccoons, will dig up yellow jacket nests um, and feed on the larvae occasionally. Other insects will also eat wasps as well. So praying mantids, dragonflies, robber flies will also feed on wasps, as well as other wasps will consume wasps as well. Wasps can also be important in seed dispersal. Uh, so some plants are going to rely on insects to disperse their seeds. Uh, usually this is ants. When we talk about the eliasome, those fleshy structures that are full of fats on those seeds, typically it's ants moving those seeds around. A lot of our spring ephemerals will do this. But in North and South Carolina, they found that yellow jackets uh, play an important role in the dispersal of trillium seeds. So not only ants are doing this, uh, in some cases wasps will also distribute these seeds. And in the case of wasps, they're probably distributing these seeds uh, much farther than ants would uh, because they're flying. So one common issue we have uh, with wasps is, is in the fall. Um, a lot of times wasps, particularly yellow jackets, become uh, unwelcome guests at outdoor activities. But in reality, all they're doing is looking for something to eat. Um, as fall approaches and we progress through the fall, a lot of flowers stop blooming. We think about our typical landscape. There's not a whole lot blooming uh, during late summer into the fall months. Uh, and this is going to reduce the amount of food that's available for, for yellow jackets and, and other social wasps and, and really other insects that are relying on pollen and nectar. Uh, in the case of yellow jackets, you know, in addition to this lack of food, uh, these nests are going to contain thousands uh, of workers. And because of this lack of food, a large number of wasps, uh, they begin searching uh, far and wide for food sources. And they're going to be attracted to sweet food items, carbonated beverages, pop, soda, whatever you want to call it, uh, juices, candy, fruit, things of that nature. So if we want to avoid um, issues with these wasps, uh, we want to place beverages uh, in cups where you can, when you're outdoors so you can see what you're drinking. Um, a lot of times if it's in a can, they can get in there and you may not see them go in there. If a yellow jacket you know, decides to, to check out your food or lands on you, blow it or brush it away rather than swatting at it, which many times will result in you getting stung if you're swatting at them. Uh, just kind of gently move them away. Another thing we can do is provide those fall blooming plants, goldenrods, asters. Uh, and this is going to provide them with a, what we could say as an alternative food source to the food from the, the picnic or whatever you're, you're consuming outdoors. Uh, if you do run into a yellow jacket or, or bald face hornet nests, um, things like that, uh, again, those can uh, pose a risk. If those are located um, away from high traffic areas, areas where people aren't nearly necessarily going all that often, one good option is just to wait and do nothing. The These social uh, wasps that we have in Illinois, they are going to die out once temperature, cold temperatures arrive. We get a couple frosts, those nests will dry off uh, or die off. And they don't reuse those nests, so it's it's kind of a one and done thing. So once we get a fro couple frosts, those nests will die. They're not going to be there again next year. Um, however, if they do pose a threat to people, they're in a high traffic area, front door by a sidewalk area where where kids are playing. We do probably need to do something about that. Um, so when it comes to managing uh, these nests, uh, first thing is remember if, if accessing the nest is difficult or if you're uncomfortable treating it yourself, you want to contact a professional pest control company to do this because we are dealing with stinging insects. Um, and this, this can be kind of dangerous to do. If, you want, if you're going to, if you're comfortable uh, and you want to do it yourself, the best time to treat these nests is going to be at dawn or dusk when they are going to be le less active. All the wasps have returned to the nests as well. And we're doing this, we're doing this at night. Uh, it's important to know that that wasps will fly at light sources. So if you're going to be doing this, if you're using a flashlight, cover it in red cellophane, use a red light, 
Um, they cannot see red very well, so they're going to be. Uh, they're not going to come out and attack that light. Where if you have a white light, they'll come after it. Uh, again, you want to wear uh, protective clothing, long pants, long sleeves, gloves. Good idea to duct tape those uh, to make sure they can't crawl up them. If you can get something to protect your head, beekeeping veil, something like that. Try to cover yourself up as much as possible. In the case of like in ground yellow jacket colonies, uh, we want to apply an insecticide to the nest, whether that be a liquid or using one of those aerosols or a dust. Uh, we're going to place that in the entrance down into the hole in the ground. Uh, and a lot of times we're going to put a shovel full of treated soil over that exit hole. So if they try to bury out of there, they're consuming that insecticide um, and, and killing off the individuals in that nest. Uh, same thing with an aerial nest. Uh, we want to use an aerosol spray. Some of those can spray 20 plus feet. And again, we're aiming that towards the entrance of the nest. If the nest is inside of a building, uh, again, Typically, we're going to be using an insectile dust for this, uh, putting that on the wall openings where the yellow jackets enter. Uh, but in this case, we don't want to seal the entrance to that colony uh, if it's in a wall. Uh, doing so, that may cause them to chew through the walls uh, into other parts of a home or, or something like that. So again, if you're not comfortable doing this, uh, contact a, a professional to do this. But again, overall, uh, our, our wasps are going to be beneficial uh, in our landscapes. Again, you know, obviously, if they're, they're posing a threat, we want to do something about them. But if they're out of the way, we can leave them be, and they'll be gone come cold weather, and they're not going to reuse uh, those nests. So uh, while wasps can be uh, be annoying um, and it can be painful at times, their, their benefits are going to far outweigh uh, the drawbacks. But from the pollination services they're providing, the pest management, insect management, uh, they're providing, and they're helping to disperse seeds, they're, they're food sources for their organisms as well. Well, that's all I've got for you for this week's Garden Bite. Hopefully you have a, a little bit better pre appreciation uh, for wasps and maybe we can get away from the the only good wasp is a dead wasp approach that many people have. Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension. Listeners, thank you for doing what you do best and that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. <laughs>